Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world. With self-care strategies from Chinese medicine, functional medicine, Ayurveda, neuroscience, and beyond. I'm your host, Brody Welch, a licensed acupuncturist and transformation catalyst, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Welcome to today's show. I'm your host, Brody Welch, licensed acupuncturist and a self-care strategist. And with me today is a colleague who, like myself, is passionate about educating other people about how to take care of themselves so that we can put that knowledge into practice to steer in the direction of health instead of in the direction of illness and not feeling well. My guest today is Mindy K. Counts who is a licensed acupuncturist and integrative medical practitioner and the co-founder of Inner Ocean Healing Center for Healing. rather, She's also a keynote speaker, retreat leader, and teacher. She's the author of Everyday Chinese Medicine, which is a book that has come out on healing remedies for immunity, vitality, and optimal health. She also is the founder of an international nonprofit, Inner Ocean Empowerment Project, providing holistic healthcare and education through volunteer service missions to underserved populations around the world and in the U.S. Mindy, welcome to A Healthy Curiosity. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. First off, it's always interesting to me how people find their way to our profession. What does your path look like? Oh my goodness, it was quite spirally. I was actually en route to becoming a therapist. I wanted to be a licensed professional counselor. I wanted to work with women and was in a professional counseling program at Naropa University when I started facing some of my own kind of challenges with a little bit of depression and anxiety, a lot of anxiety and it was sort of derailing my focus and someone recommended, um, bless her, that I try acupuncture. And I ended up, at the time, I thought acupuncture was really only for pain. That was just in my mind, what I thought, what, what I'd heard. And so I did decide to try it. And it was my first session, which I still remember, was amazing. I remember walking out of her office and feeling like myself again, and feeling a lightness of being. It wasn't like all my problems went away, but it was like a lightness of being and a sense of okayness and basic goodness about my life. And I did commit to a year, basically, of of treatment with her and and it totally changed my life. And, and after that year, I did decide to finish out my counseling degree and then um, went straight, pretty much straight into acupuncture school. <laughs> uh, what a so. cool path. So I'd love to, if you don't mind sharing a little bit more about, uh, did it actually help your depression, like beyond that momentary sense of well-being? Oh my gosh, I, absolutely. I can't even tell you. It was like now I'm someone, I believe we should all be in therapy and, and I have been in therapy for years and, and was in therapy for years before getting acupuncture. And there was something about the added, you know, moving energy actually in my body through the treatment that helped me expedite some of the more cognitive patterns and stories I had about myself, you know, dealing with depression and the sadness and the negative self-image. It was almost like I just got to push the gas pedal a little bit faster through some of that terrain. And it was, you know, acupuncture combined with my relationship with my acupuncturist, which we were very much diving into the the terrain of the elements, looking at patterns in my life and some of my story and past medical uh, challenges, you know, body stuff and mental stuff as well. And I remember after about a year of working with this particular um, acupuncturist, she said, what do you say we open up your file and look back to some of your, you know, your initial things that you were working on and just make sure we've covered some ground. So she opens up my file and she's like, so where would you say you're at with anxiety right now? And I have to say, when she asked me that question, 
it like didn't even land anywhere in my body. I was like, what do you mean anxiety? Like I hadn't actually felt anxious in so long. It was like she was talking about <laughs> Right, it's about like someone person. someone else's chart, right? Like that, <laughs> exactly. so long ago, we forget. Exactly. And she was like, it says that you said on your very first appointment that you were experiencing anxiety 80% of the time mm-hmm. and at a level of about eight out of 10. Yeah. So, oh, I mean- yeah. Night and and day after different. a year, I couldn't even touch it. You yeah. know, it was like not even a part of me. So I appreciate that you mentioned the fact that, I mean, for, for listeners to this show, most likely most people are familiar with the fact that Chinese medicine is this complete system of healthcare that encompasses not only acupuncture, but also things like lifestyle and diet and meditation and body work and, and also applying the philosophy to our lives. And so that the idea that the relationship that you had with your practitioner, where you were getting into the patterns, the how you habitually relate to life is mm. as much as a way that we stagnate and limit our growth as anything else. And that, that, so that a lot of, you know, a lot of times when people ask me about like Chinese medicine coaching, for example, people are like, well, how does that work? You can't needle people over the phone. Like, oh yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Like there is, there are so many ways that we can use our insights into people's psyches because of our training in Chinese medicine that we can help people get out of ruts. And of course there's, you've done all sorts of specialized training in your counseling of knowing, giving people tools to take care of themselves but I'd love to hear a little bit more about your approach of like using, how do you, how do you help people understand their story Mm. so that they can transcend it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, back to what you were saying about basically acupuncture being, you know, one of the branches of this vast system of medicine. You know, one of the first conversations I have with new clients is, hey, this isn't just a you coming in and receiving needles every week kind of thing. This is a participatory journey that we go on together and I will commit just as much as you commit. And we will be looking at unearthing your diet and your lifestyle and kind of looking for areas where you are really congruent and then areas where it's more misaligned. You know, for example, if you're a real sort of yin natured person or introverted natured person, and you're in a very yang driven position uh, in your work, that's going to lead to a lot of exhaustion and a lot of, you know, health problems, usually a lot of adrenal dysfunction and that sort of thing. So, so that part about, yes, you know, it, there's so much more than just needles when it comes to seeing a Chinese medicine practitioner. And when it comes to story, the stories we hold are so important. One, because our stories really craft who we become. And if we hold stories about negative self-image or lack of success or you know, always waiting for the other shoe to drop, that kind of thing, then we basically create a world where that's always possible. And so part of looking at stories is is starting to kind of crack open the possibility that that it's not 100% true, you know, the stories that we hold about ourselves, that there might be some wiggle room in there. Sometimes we get stories from our parents or our families. You know, if our if our mom had a low self-esteem and her mom had a low self-esteem, we're likely going to get all the signs and signals of developing a low self-esteem as young women. And so that's a big part of what I like to unpack with my clients is looking at what are all of these sort of explicit and implicit stories we've adopted. And then we just start chipping away. You know, we look at antidotes, uh, antidote behaviors, antidote mantras, getting acupuncture and body work itself you know, really enables the nervous system to develop more elasticity so we can actually have, create room for new stories, for new paradigms. And so that's what I love about being able to integrate both the sort of cognitive kind of talk therapy aspect of working with clients, as well as the the actual acupuncture and working physically with a person's body, we get to help them not necessarily transcend, but really start to integrate some of these things, these um, new ways of being and, and 
examining the old ways that are maybe not not as helpful. So, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but no, I, I think um, that it just what I what I was hoping to get at. I think you you answered kind of beautifully. Is sort of looking looking at the past, looking at like, well, mm. well, if if I do have low self esteem or low self worth or an idea, a, a limiting belief about who I am in the world. First of all, where did that come from, and is it true? Mm. And just recognizing that that these stories that often hold sway about that that influence our our daily actions and also how we view the world, whether or not we view and value what is in ourselves already, this is where I, I feel like looking at ourselves through the lens of yin and yang and through the lens of the five elements that we can really help people like. It, that I, I love that you said like antidote behaviors and antidote mantras. Like I, I'd love to to have you expound on that. But just the, the the idea that for me at least when I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about helping someone, for example, if they are feeling bad about themselves because of X, Y, and Z, you know, like mm-hmm. let let's say they're feeling bad about themselves that they they don't feel like they have a right to assert their own wants and needs and desires that other people's are more important or that it's selfish for for asserting those needs, right? That's that's a pattern yeah. that we often see with our Earth element patients, right? And, and mm-hmm. being able to call that into question and say like, okay, well, this thought form, like if it's not necessarily true, that opens up other avenues for being in the world where you can break this pattern. Pattern, right where you, where mm-hmm. you where you can kind of step and evolve in, in a different way and 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 in that sense teaching people that that maybe you had parents who didn't value the same kind of things that you valued or maybe you mm-hmm. had like maybe it was necessary to adapt to the chaos of your upbringing by becoming very earthy and that that's actually an exaggeration you know or something that you don't mm-hmm. necessarily need to lean on as heavily as an adult and so being able to just like kind of look at different traits and tendencies through this five element lens I think a lot of times people can go like, oh yeah, there's me being overly metal again, or like, oh yeah, there's there's my there's where my wood element really takes over and whacks me out of balance and causes me to deplete into my reserves. And and just helping people understand, like looking through the lens of the five elements, they can oftentimes see their their own imbalances and be able to act differently. Uh, would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yes. And I just, you know, feeling the sense of relief in the languaging of the five elements. For example, you know, someone who says, I'm depressed, I'm chronically depressed, versus someone who says, I really struggle with a metal imbalance. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's not about bypassing, but it is about acknowledging the stories, right? There, there's a very different energetic quality to I am depressed, I am a chronically depressed person versus I, I really struggle with metal. I really yeah. struggle with metal energy and letting go and letting the things that need to die, die so that they can make space mm-hmm. for the new. That's my challenge. And so, so that know, the, frames it totally differently, right? And and, and oh, we as practitioners, yeah. like our first job should be to strip off the the allopathic label, right? That we take depression mm. and we throw it in the garbage <laughs> and we say, all right, depression can mean ten thousand things. What does it look like for you? And then we get a sense of what it looks like for that person, and then we're able to maybe ascribe a new label to it or like just see it in a, with a different framework and be able to move from there. Um, which I think is, is just the gift of looking through multiple lenses in, in, in the world. I'm wondering if it would be potentially interesting and useful to do like a super fast overview of what the five elements are like so that people can get a taste of, because um, I know this is something that you dive into pretty heavily in your book, coming from a five element tradition and um, whether or not that could maybe pique people's interest in, in seeing themselves differently. Oh, sure. You know, there's so much we could say about the five yeah. elements. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and it is the kind of thing um, that, yes, obviously it could, it, we could go on for days and years talking about it, but just in terms of like people uh, or like what, yeah. it, just in terms of, of maybe um, we could, we could make this, we could narrow the scope a little bit to the sort of like dominant strengths and weaknesses that tend to throw people out of balance if they are, yeah, just the the mental emotional aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I would say, let's start with fire. How about that? Sure. 
<laughs> the element of fire is, you know, sort of the most yang energy out of the five. And so if you think about summertime and that kind of upward rising, expansive kind of energy, um, the emotions that are related to that are joy. And then the other end of the spectrum would be sadness. And so sometimes to kind of assess someone's uh, fire element, I would ask them questions like, where is your joy? What are you celebrating? Who or what can you trust? Because trust is a big thing. When we have a really solid, fi healthy fire element, we really trust not just ourselves, but, but we can also trust the way we've set up our world and, and the way we've set up our lives and there, our decisions from moment to moment and have close, intimate relationships that, um, that are safe. And so... Another element, earth, earth element, which is related to the stomach and the spleen. Yeah. Actually, um, before we leave fire for a second. Yeah. So, so like, so in other words, every, like, just to, to contextualize this a little bit, every element, if kind of like, if you look through, if you look at refining light through a prism, you can see all the different colors and its component parts. And so when we're thinking about this five element, you can think about it, visualizing it on a circle where like the bottom of the circle is the most yin, the top of the circle is the most yang. And yang is this like upward, outward, hot, busy, active. Fire element is the most yang. And every every element is going to have like a season, a taste, a color, a virtue, uh, an emotion, uh, you know, like they're really every everything in the universe could be <laughs> divided into one of these five things, which is why it's like, we're just giving this quick cursory overview. But, but yeah, yeah. Like within that, there are sort of like these lessons of the elements that are, you know, that people kind of sometimes have to learn. And so, yeah, if people are having trouble accessing joy, or if they're having trouble trusting, also the fire element contains like the pericardium, the heart protector, which has to do with boundaries and has to do with our, our one-on-one -on -one relationships and, and things like that. So so within these elements, there are like there's there's room to kind of maneuver, and really acupoints can be little portals of consciousness that can that can kind of restore the the, the virtues and the functions of the elements of the body, and that we can steer with things like food and lifestyle and diet and and rewriting our stories, like in terms of how we think about it. So okay, so now moving on to Earth. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for that visual too. You know, that visual is just sort of burned in my psyche. So <laughs> whenever yeah, I start Well, it is like all of us as practitioners, it's like, <laughs> how can we not draw this out? But unfortunately, people are going to have to use their imaginations because it's a podcast. <laughs> yes. Well, and the other thing I'll just add on to what you said is that we all are made up of all five of the elements. As you were saying, it's like a prism and we are also a little bit usually more dominant in one element versus some of the others. And so, and then sometimes we can have kind of a, an Achilles heel sort of element, something that when stuff goes down, you know, we, this element gets shaky. It's like if you always get a little bit of a cough or cold every time you get really stressed out, or if you, you know, get really irritable as a sign of stress, you know, that could be the wood element getting a little bit shaky. And so, so I will say that as well, but that we are also made up of all the elements. And so, you know, this as a practitioner, we, we do work on all of them, even though someone might be like so fire dominant, you know, we can't negate it, but we still always want to encourage all the elements to stay in balance for that person. Yeah, like it's it's not about yeah. making everybody look the same. It's not about yeah. equal slices of the pie, but it's about recognizing, okay, if you're somebody who is who has your strengths and in, in your gifts to the world are found in this particular element, it tells you what kind of context to be in in order to maybe to self-actualize easily and what kind of what, how you're going to find your happiness. But you still yeah. also need to like be in in balance within that. And so <laughs> the the idea that again, knowledge is power and that this is how we can help ourselves steer and the idea sometimes are like you can have fire be your dominant element and that's where the problems show up too you know like mm -hmm. that, that are sometimes yep. our greatest strength and our greatest weakness are one and the same thing exactly yes and I love that you mention this part about sort of more purpose and uh, more virtue aspect of the elements because I remember you know I've had so many teachers over the years and and there were sort of a a group of teachers who they believed that the elements were only your 
Achilles heel. And it was like every fiber of my being was like rejecting that information because it's not at all what I had ever seen in my treatment room. It, it just didn't make sense to me. And so it sort of set me on this journey of really inquiring, are they only challenges? And, and the answer is absolutely not. When the elements, when someone who has a lot of fire in their constitution and, and we can help them balance it and find a way to live with that fire so it doesn't burn them out, then they are so in their heart seat and able to live so fully from a place of authenticity rather than trying to be like someone else or telling them their fire is bad or, you know what I mean? It's like, really encouraging yeah. the sort of natural impulses that we have. Exactly. And, and if someone mm -hmm. can look to like maybe somebody who's like somebody who's fiery, they tend to be very social, very extroverted, outgoing. Yeah. Maybe they like to to perform. And if they were told as a kid, like, oh, you're a show off or stop hogging the spotlight. It's like, then that fire person is going to have a tough time, right? Like, or they're, they're yes. going to, they're going to be told that they're too much and that they need to tone it down so that other people can be comfortable. And that might actually be holding them back from, from like what they were born to do on the planet. Mm -hmm. I am so with you. <laughs> yeah, and that said, right? Like somebody who's fiery, they mean they. It may be harder for that person to see their very real need for rest and downtime and alone time because it's not in their nature to necessarily yeah. need that as much as somebody who's naturally has a lot of water in their constitution, who's naturally drawn to want to introspect and reflect and and spend a lot of time contemplating their spirituality on a mountaintop or something like that. Uh -huh. You know. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> All right, but let's keep going around the circle. So, okay. fi so fire for people who want to stick with this visual, uh, fire would be kind of at the very top, the most yang. And then we're going to move over into the earth element, which is maybe going to be like two o'clock on this, on this clock face of elements <laughs> that we're looking at. Yes. yes. And then also where we're headed to right. energetically right now. Yes. So we um, move from summer to late summer. We move, mm -hmm. so we're, we're starting to move a little bit more yin from, from, Yang. And so what is this late summer season and um, an earth element, spleen, stomach affiliation? What's that all about? Yeah. So someone who has a, a lot of earth in their constitution tends to be um, a, a very nourishing presence, someone who, who cares about not, not only nourishing themselves, but also nourishing others and being of service. They might have a really great community. They might have a really strong relationship with food and growing food, maybe gardening and things like that. You know, some of the emotions that are associated with earth are empathy or compassion. And so someone who has really good, healthy earth element is someone who is able to really see themselves in the other and have an immense amount of compassion for them. And so... And then, of course, like you said, the stomach and the spleen are the organs associated with earth, which are, you know, sort of our front line of digestion and um, nutrition absorption, nutrient absorption. And so really working with our own microbiome and our own sense of groundedness and centeredness here on earth. And so... Yeah. Is there anything else you want to add to that? I could cycle around oh, yeah. the elements all day. Sure. So. Yeah. Well, it's I guess like maybe just drawing the parallel that if mm. if Earth element is about nurturing all life on the planet, that's like kind of the that's the global aspect of Earth. And then inside mm. the body, the Earth element, the spleen and stomach, that's responsible for nourishment and you know nourishing all the cells in the body and getting that nourishment where it needs to go in the body. And just like compassion, it's not arbitrary. It's not like there's a, like a list of rules we have to to to, to look up it's the nature of earth is to want to be is to want to be generous and giving and supportive and and loving and compassionate like this extension outward of this of of its nature right of of it, its nature is about nurturing and so so that kind of like that inherent in like if we look at what it does in nature you can extrapolate from what that element does inside the body. And that, um, mm. yeah. So when we have this, like this giving loyal, wanting to support, wanting to, wanting to be rooted in the ground, wanting to connect to food, for example, that it, when out of balance, there is the tendency to give beyond our capacity, right. Or to, or to mm -hmm. maybe not assert our needs because we don't want to rock the boat. We want to keep with harmony or we want to, you know, we want, it's, it's important to us that other people get their needs met. So maybe ours go on a back burner and that that can lead to 
um, that can lead to an imbalance. It can be a little bit, uh, and and that thus prevent us as earthy people from generously giving of ourselves. Absolutely, well said. Yes, earth out of balance. Earth is, um, yeah, can overextend. Be that overextending, and to where I'm, I'm putting your needs first, and then I'm just going to exhaust myself because I'm really taking care of you. It's. Mm-hmm. So, and for people who might be seeing themselves in that description, what's your favorite mm-hmm. self care assignment for them? Oh my gosh, um, <laughs> a, a lot of things. I, one of the things I would say is a mantra that I like to work with is that my my self worth is not tied to taking care of others. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. And that's a so, big one, and yeah. to, because because from that mindset, when we believe it then we get to include ourselves in that circle of compassion that we so easily extend to everyone else. Exactly. Yes. (laughs) All right. So after late summer, um, after late summer comes autumn, this is a time that we associate with lungs and large intestine and the metal elements. And so that's, we're going to be moving even more deeply towards yin. So maybe we're at like uh, 4.30 on our clock face and, um, and go tell me about metal. Yeah. So um, with metal, I always think of the energy of like the the high priestess or priest, you know, someone who is pretty connected to something larger than themselves, someone who is, has sort of a, a bird, easily can find that bird's eye view on life, you know, find that sort of big picture perspective. Um, someone who is un- more understanding or more willing to step into the uh, letting go death transformation fire that is always happening in our lives. And so, and grief, as you said, is one of the emotions associated with the metal element. And so it's not about, um, you know, of course, an imbalance in metal can lead to being stuck in grief, but that grieving when it's healthy is a really natural response to this shedding, this letting go, this saying goodbye of our, to our old ways and calling in something new, a new way, a new level of health, um, you name it. And so, and with the correspondence, the corresponding to the lungs, I think about, you know, inspiration. I know when my, when my metal is really healthy, I, I wake up feeling really inspired and really connected, a good solid sense of belonging here on this earth. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then on a physical level, you know, if you are someone who really struggles with metal, like we were talking earlier, you know, depression, sadness, things like that can happen. And also, you know, on a physical level, uh, someone who really struggles with their immune system, you know, getting coughs and colds and asthmas and things like that, which sometimes we look at as kind of unprocessed grief. Also, um, you know, constipation, which is literally the body's physical way of not letting go, um, can also happen when the metal is out of balance. This episode of A Healthy Curiosity is brought to you by my Basics of Chinese Medicine, Your Inner Ecosystem course. If you're curious about the energetic anatomy of your subtle body, the five elements, the psycho-spiritual dimensions of your internal organs, and how to align with the rhythms of nature, this course is for you. How cool would it be to know what point you could press on to calm yourself down or make a headache go away, or to stop gas and bloating and drop extra weight easily when you understand the body clock, digestive fire, and the energetics of food as medicine? Looking through the lens of yin and yang and the five elements, you'll see yourself and the patterns that you use to stay safe in a whole new way so you don't have to be bound by them. If you're looking for more tools for your self-care toolbox and a framework for personal evolution, this Learn From Anywhere course is ready whenever you are. This course provides a deep dive into Chinese medical theory without having to enroll in acupuncture school or get lost in a sea of jargon. I make these teachings accessible and fun without dumbing it down. For a limited time, you'll get 20% off this course when you use the coupon code POWERTOOLS at checkout. Just head to the classes and meditations page at brodywelch.com. That's Brody with an IE and Welch with a CH. And enroll. Now back to the show. 
So tell us about a favorite self-care tip if someone is perhaps like depressed because they haven't let go of something or like, or maybe they're, maybe it's, it's a perfectly appropriate non-pathological grieving time, but what do these people need to do if they don't want to feel stuck or, or, or sad Mm. all day long? You know, like what it just, I know what I would do, but I'm curious about your, your first (laughs) assignment. Yeah. I mean, this is a great question, right? Because it does depend on the person and kind of their level of resourcefulness. And if they are kind of wildly unresourced, meaning they haven't done, they don't have a, they are potentially at risk of opening up the grief portal and then just diving in there for days and days. You know, we obviously don't want that to happen. And so sometimes I like to introduce this concept of titration, where what I recommend is actually once I've worked with someone a little bit and I kind of understand where the grief is coming from, and I can kind of encourage them to let's just touch it together. Let's start with just touching on it, you know, versus opening up the floodgates and just stepping into (laughs) onto the train car and going south, you know. So we'll just kind of touch it and just start to explore a little bit of that grief and feel a little bit of it. And then we will pull out of there and then we will resource again. By resource, I'm sure you know what I mean, but things like doing nurturing things for ourselves, drink some tea, talk about other things, um, you know, maybe talk with a friend on the phone, you know, things that really bring our energy up and remind us of who we are and the healthy aspects of what we're trying to call in. And then each time we dive in a little bit more and a little bit more. And so this is the titration piece. And acknowledging that some days we don't really have the capacity to to dive into that terrain. Yeah, right. And that's okay. But the importance of visiting that terrain allows the energy that's there to move, right? Like that's it the, that really, I don't know that 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 grief exactly. needs more than time and space, right? But if we yeah. but there's a difference between trying to outrun it by staying busy versus giving giving yes. it a little time and space. Oh, yes, exactly. Yeah. And mm-hmm. when you're done with that, I like to I like to suggest a pranayam practice, you know, to just mm-hmm. help people feel like to because again we're we're in the territory of the lungs, so we can utilize the lungs, get somebody breathing differently. It's going to change their physiology. So maybe something like a breath of joy or like something like that is that is more uh, a yang kind of a breathing practice. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And as you know, there are these yeah. magical little acupuncture points <laughs> that also can just tap into a little bit of that old grief, that stuck energy. You know, I think of um, some of the great void points and the great abyss points that really when we are so far removed where we have kept ourselves so busy for so long, we're really kind of disconnected to that aspect of our being, we can, you know, burn a little moxa or do a little tapping or talk, even just talking to those acupuncture right. points. An essential oil would be great. So yes. tell, tell us about where one of these points is in case people want to try it. Um, oh, great question. So let's see. What about very great abyss? How about that one? So if you look at the inside of your forearm and you see the crease from the inside of your elbow, and then you see your wrist crease, about halfway in the middle of your forearm, just a little bit to the thumb side, you'll find like a little well in there. And that is the one of the great abyss points that really helps to start breaking up some of that old grief. And what I like to tell my clients is if it's tender, you want to go there, you know, gently, Mm -hmm. but it tells you that you're in the, like, it's, it's the difference. I I always like to use the analogy that like that where the textbook says a point should be is like the zip code and you palpate (laughs) to find like the PO box, right? Like to get the exact location. So if it's sensitive, it's probably tells you that you're in the right place. And if it's especially tender, it probably means you need it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, okay, great. So somebody can anoint that point or burn moxa on that point or press that mm-hmm. point. And by the way, this is not medical advice. Um, <laughs> you know, this is, this is for informational purposes only. 
So Mm -hmm. if we continue around the cycle, we move from metal to water. So we move from just like that, um, we move from fall to winter, which is the season that corresponds with the water element or kidney and bladder. And so Mm -hmm. what's kidney and bladder about? Yes. So now we are in sort of the most yin quality of energy in the cycle. And so this is, you know, deep winter kind of energy and cold uh, and wet and still and quiet and yes. inward and all of that yin stuff. <laughs> yes. Right? And, and such an invitation with this energy to go inward and to be more alone. And so definitely something that COVID has uh, put a little pressure on all of our water elements. Um, you know, are we able to be in that stillness and be more alone? and be okay and find ourselves without sort of the bouncing off of the culture the way that we usually do. And so, yes, and so the adrenals also, which sit right on top of the kidneys, are very much a part of this water aspect as well. And, you know, kind of what is typical of the most extreme kind of introverted person are qualities that you would associate with water, kind of a deep, rich imagination, maybe someone who has a tendency to watch and listen more than actually engage. Of course, I'm being very general because that's not true of all water. And someone who has the capacity to work with fear and face uh, face fear, fear of death, you know, big fears like that, as well as uh, sort of the daily fears um, of getting in our car and driving to work and things like that. There's a lot of fear that's been kicked up, obviously, because of the pandemic. I feel like I don't know anyone who isn't dealing with some amount of low-grade background noise fear right now. Oh, my God. I'm curious how you help people um, deal with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, since the pandemic, you mean? Yeah, or just like just in generalized advice for kind of like for settling the water element for for being for helping people find some peace and some calm amidst Mm -hmm. what can feel very choppy and and uncertain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the things that this fear, this COVID pandemic has really stirred up is the fear that we're alone that you know you're alone over there and I'm alone over here and so that's definitely the where I like to start is you know you're not alone I know it might feel that way but there's a, a network of people who are who are f- experiencing these similar things and so Another thing that I really like to do is actually get people in water, in a body of water. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, because, you like know, a what bath ends up, at the like very least. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yes. Like a bath or even just a foot bath at the very least. But the, the capacity that water has to help us discharge any of the, you know, the gunk that we carry around with us on a daily basis um, is incredible. And so even just to literally sink your body into the element and allow your body to rest into water is such a gift and can really transform some of our biggest, uh, you know, fear thoughts. Um, Love that. I love Definitely. the I love the Epsom salt bath uh, with a little mm. vetiver essential oil. That's like one of mm. my favorite sort of like deeply grounding, deeply rooting, deeply like letting letting it just take uh, the excess from your body, but also like and that infusion of magnesium that just helps all oh. everything let go. Exactly. Yes. And I'm, a, I'm of the thinking of the more salt, the better. Like I tell mm-hmm. people, you know, four cups salt minimum. Ooh, I gotta um, try that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, also salt being um, sort of the, the flavor and the mineral of water, of the water element. It's like, yes, let's just feed your body this nourishment and the salt that helps our bodies to relax and our vasculature to open up and help us get a a reset hit a reset button in our nervous systems and so mm -hmm. yeah I I love it and just food wise if people are craving salt it might be that that there's that that's something to pay attention to like is there enough downtime quiet introspection you know like that is like could it be that the 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 adrenals are needing something the kidneys are needing something here 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And with so much adrenal dysfunction, you know, nowadays people who are not that you or I have ever done this, <laughs> but spending more chi than they have, you know, and then the backlash, of course, is that oh my gosh, then yeah, <laughs> right. Then you wiped out, right? And um, like, I feel like I have this conversation with almost every practitioner because it's in our nature to want to to want to mm-hmm. exceed our own capacity. Like a lot of us have some earth in our constitution, and there is, yeah. you know, or a drive. To, to educate the world or both maybe <laughs> like mm-hmm. I know I know to me I, I have a fair amount of earth and wood in my constitution but what those two things drive me to do is deplete myself and when I'm mm-hmm. when I'm running an energy deficit when I know that I when I do my energy budget and I know that I'm not doing enough when I'm expending more than I'm giving back then that means that I'm necessarily dipping into my reserves too much and that's yeah. that's the kidneys right that's that's the that's the water element it's this reservoir that we can dip into um, when necessary and recognizing that that's not sustainable, right? That that when we do that over time, that's where aging comes from. When we start Mm -hmm. to drain this special kind of energy called Jing that lives in the kidneys, that's one of the theories in Chinese medicine about how we get old, how we we start Mm -hmm. getting less juicy and when we're not able to keep up with the repairs that the body requires on a regular basis. Yes, well said. Um, mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but I digress. We're we're in the water element. We're talking about <laughs> we're talking about depletion. We're talking about all this stuff, and then mm-hmm. we've got one more element to deal with, and that's wood. So if we come up from from the depths of uh, six p.m. on this on this clock face, we're we're moving up. But we're we're coming to like what like eight in the morning, nine in the morning, mm-hmm. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Where the wood <laughs> element is like we're moving from yin to yang, and we're moving into from kid and bladder to liver and gallbladder. Mm-hmm. So yes. tell us about liver, gallbladder, and wood element. Wood element. So the wood element, yes, as you said, it is that movement of coming from that winter time to summertime, which is a forward and upward moving energy. And I like to use the word force. It's a force kind Mm -hmm. of energy. And anger also, which is a force as well as the emotion that's often associated with wood. And again, there is that beautiful, healthy aspect of, of being angry and how much change we can create in the world with our anger. And then of course, there is sort of the unhealthy aspect of anger, which I would label more like a rage where it's kind of a no boundaries And so someone who has a lot of wood energy, first of all, I will say that I feel like wood is definitely an element that is really encouraged in our culture. Rewarded, right? It's because (laughs) the wood people are the achievers and the entrepreneurs and the drivers and strivers (laughs) and the people who are like, you know, who, who are... Are, it's in their nature to want to um, achieve every goal and be the first, be the best, be the only. Yes, exactly. And productivity and uh, they're the doers. And so again, there is that healthy, virtuous aspect of, you know, someone who has a lot of wood, they're, you know, make great lobbyists, they make great grassroots, you know, let's change the way the yeah. system is working right now, because it's not actually working. And, and so they're going to be the chief vision. organizer, right? The person yes. who is like it, who is, who's maybe the, the, the one, the one who's leading the charge, um, mm, or the, the general, w- right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. And they and they can hold the vision. Oftentimes someone who has a lot of wood is able to hold the the vision, the plan, the blueprint of, of exactly how this can be different and and why, you know, and draw up the comrades needed to uh, fulfill this mission. And so again, of course, as that energy, like all of them, can have an imbalanced aspect of it, when we start to see a lot of irritation or um, repressed emotions, you know, emotions that come out sideways. Um, (laughs) And even a little bit of like backing up with toxins, um, someone who's not moving things through their body as well. You know, a lot of those kinds of things can start to happen. Issues with digestion as well, um, food not moving through. And yeah, so when the wood gets out of balance, I feel like I often see it first and more emotionally kind of uh, emotions that haven't moved in a long time 
And also I will say lately, especially I've been seeing a lot of really kind of depressed wood, you know, people who have a lot of wood, who have these incredible visions who right now are not able to fulfill them in the way that we would outside of a pandemic. There's a lot of red tape on, you know, sort of the outside work that we can do. And so I have been seeing a little bit more uh, kind of depression around that. Yeah. So there is this like it, that the nature of wood is like the nature of a tree trying to grow. It's it, the, it wants to move upward and outward. And when we are thwarted by circumstances, for example, like lockdown or quarantine or whatever, it's yeah, like that, that thwartedness creates a kind of frustration, right? That we're, we're not, we're not able to do the thing that we are, are that we have a vision for, that we have a plan for, which are very much wood element things, right? That um, visioning, yeah. planning, wanting to move, Wanting to wanting to make things happen, wanting to be young, and not being able to do that can be incredibly frustrating. Mm-hmm. For someone with a lot of wood energy, and so, so what, what's the medicine for that? Oh gosh! <laughs> um, I mean, besides an excellent formula called free and easy wanderer, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> what else is a really excellent medicine for that? Exactly. Well, one of the things I will say is that I do see, and I'm not sure if it's it's probably no longer just Colorado, but you know, the draw to substances when wood is out of balance, I think, is really yeah. pretty strong. I don't know if you would agree with me. Um, oh, I think that. there's no doubt. I think the data would back mm-hmm. that up for sure. <laughs> that, well, and and also just that. So, like, if the wood element is about timing and like mm-hmm. things unfolding to the, according to the proper timing, like you mentioned, right? Like there could be a backup, like when, when energy stops moving freely and there's this backup in the digestive system, or maybe there's like PMS and there's like this backup in the menstrual cycle, kind of that idea that what we want to do is, is for things to relax and move freely. So the desire for something like alcohol or marijuana, you know, like something Mm -hmm. that's going to like, that, that's going to help like, ah, like this feeling of like letting go or this feeling of relaxation, we're going to want that, or we're going to want to, uh, to rev up with some caffeine or some sugar, you know, like that, this idea of like being able to control our emotional state by looking to potent substances that do that is, I think, uh, yeah, we see that a lot. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. And one of the things I've noticed is, you know, I, I never want to tell someone who has a lot of wood uh, that they just need to chill out. You know, it's like, so not. The oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> what do you mean? Right. That, that, <laughs> right. Because like a lot um, of times, like th- those people, it's not even in their nature to chill out. So usually exactly. like to me, yes. it's like, that's like those people tend to need a, like a program of like, here's how you can achieve relaxation, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, like appeal to the doing nature. So maybe (laughs) something like, rather than saying like, go meditate, it might be like some, a Qigong practice or like a, you know, a yoga practice where, where they are breathing and moving at the same time that can help, Mm -hmm. can help move some of that stagnation, but in a way that is a bit more like that they'll actually do it as opposed to like sit down and do nothing or sit down and like, you know, try to let your mind be empty. Like, yeah, those people aren't going to go for that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say also, you know, finding a way to help them funnel their energy versus, you know, kind of being splayed out in 500 directions, Mm -hmm. you know, if that's kind of reeling it into one project or one or two focuses for now. And also, yeah, wondering about this physical activity part. I, I do notice that a lot of people who have a lot of wood in their constitution often need a little more activity than the rest of us. Um, yeah, you know, those people aren't going to be able to relax <laughs> till they go for a walk or to, you know, exactly. to or a run yeah. or whatever it is. But yes, like mm-hmm. having helping those people recognize that that helps them stay in balance maybe more than like that second glass of wine or whatever mm-hmm. it is they're doing. Yes, exactly. You got it. <laughs> I can't believe we just made it around the five element cycle in under an hour. That was pretty impressive. Um, <laughs> but, that is pretty amazing. <laughs> and I really appreciate your take on it because it's like, you know, that just that there's because there's so much to these things and being able to um being able to just bounce ideas off of a colleague. It's really fun for me. Mm-hmm. And and hopefully we've given people some ideas as to like ways of looking at themselves with a bit more compassion. And also mm-hmm. maybe with some ideas about like how to work with your nature in order to achieve balance. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything else that you want to add before we wrap up here. Gosh, I think the only thing if we hadn't said it already is just that 
permission to be who you are and that and and recognizing that those natural impulses you have might actually speak to something so much bigger and what your kind of gift or true nature is and so you know like you were saying earlier we definitely get these messages daily that we kind of are encouraged to be pretty similar, you know, we're kind of encouraged to all be the same and be the same level of functioning every day. And, and really that, that I don't think that's true at all. I think that our natural impulses and and elements, of course, is how I would also language that is part of our beauty and our individual gift. And so if someone is listening and thinking, gosh, I'm really interested in this language, but I have these things that I'm working with. Sometimes these things that we're working with are actually quite virtuous, you know, like, like we were talking about the emotions. It's just, you know, nurturing them and helping them heal and come to the other side where they, they provide us energy rather than take our energy away. Um, so I think that's the, that's the big thing that I would say. I, that's so beautiful. It's so beautiful because it's so true that like, that as one of my Qigong teachers, uh, Master Liu Ho used to say, is that like all of the trees in the forest don't grow to look exactly the same, right? Like that there's variations in different yes. different species and different shapes and different heights and different size and how they look through the different <laughs> different seasons is all different and giving ourselves permission to really um, honor it, be in the present moment and, and work to like, first of all, just get, get a sense of being connected to ourselves so that we can identify what do we need in this particular moment rather than forcing ourselves into a mold that either isn't us or might've been right for us last season, but isn't necessarily right now. Like it's Mm. that we all, we move through these seasons and they move through us. And we have the, like, just as we have all of the different elements within us, there's also times in our life where one element might be, might be more dominant than another and recognizing that the nature of life is dynamic. And so Mm -hmm. if we can stay with that, if we can stay with that impulse by, by being as present as we can with ourselves and being able to respond and have this dialogue with our bodies and hearts and minds and spirits so that we can steer in that direction of health rather than the direction of disease. That's really Mm. what it's all about. Yes, beautifully said. (laughs) Mindy Counts, this has been such a fun conversation. I'm so glad to meet you and congratulations on the publication of your book, Everyday Chinese Medicine. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. What a total delight it was. Tell us, uh, we're going to have links in the show notes to where people can connect with you, but if you just want to give us uh, maybe your website or the best way for people to reach out. Sure. The best way to connect with me would be my website, which is mindykcounts.com. That's M-I-N-D-I-K-C-O-U-N-T-S.com. And there's a whole bunch of links on there to videos and book my book as well and some other ways to work with me if you get excited about that wonderful we'll make sure to have links in the show notes over at brodywelch.com brody with an ie and welch with a ch mindy thank you so much again for joining me this has been so much fun thanks for listening today to check out the show notes get on my email list or drop me a line head to brodywelch.com that's brody with an ie and welch with a ch i'd love to hear from you If you learn something new or feel inspired to try something different in your life, I'd love for you to pay it forward by sharing this episode with a friend who you think could also benefit and give them a reason to listen. You'll be helping to create a world where we encourage each other to embody self-respect. Till next time, be good to yourself.